Ah, oh, Ben, it's very good to be talking to you all the way from London. Good to be here. And Thank welcome you. to Green Left Media. And we're here today to talk about your book on Karl Kautsky on democracy and republicanism. Thank you very much for making the time to record this interview Pleasure. and thank you very much for translating this book it's um it's very interesting reading um now karl kautsky used to be a name to to conjure with back well at the in the late 1800s early 1900s in the in the world socialist movement um but um it's not a name that's very well known to people now um, except that some people might have heard the expression the renegade Kautsky, which um, would probably be a really good name for a punk rock group or something like that. Um, but uh, just briefly, can you tell us uh, a little bit about, well, who was Karl Kautsky? Why was he so famous? Right, well, so Kautsky as a student really becomes interested in in marxist politics in vienna he's czech austrian uh, but uh, by by birth and, and and heritage um and he he joins the, the austrian socialist movement in vienna as a as a young lad um becomes familiar with the the austrian social democrats newspapers etc that they're still relatively primitive at the time and uh, as a result of that, his interest then is a kind of a long uh, history, he tries to become an academic, but that doesn't quite work out, etc. But he decides at one point then to devote his energies to the, the, the growing, burgeoning international socialist movement and moves to Germany, which is obviously the, or I say obviously it's the core of that movement in a sense, the most successful party coming out of, well, at, at the time actually was still in the, uh, in a condition of semi-legality. Um, and he was slightly unhappy uh, with the, the the political level, I think, of the Austrian Social Democrats at the time. So he starts to uh, become friends with people like Edward Bernstein, who, again, we will know as the kind of the arch revisionist of German social democracy. However, uh, in this particular period in the 1880s, 1890s, he's one of the leading voices of you know Marxist revolutionary Marxist politics, as it were. He edits the uh, Der Sozialdemokrat, which was the a legal newspaper that was smuggled in from Switzerland into Germany during the anti-socialist laws. So he's got a, a, a strong reputation as, as a leftist. And then um, uh, at various points, uh, well, uh, Mar uh, Kautsky moves to London and becomes acquainted also with Marx and Engels. Um, Marx is a very famous, often quoted, uh, dismissive of Marx uh, about uh, about Kautsky, uh, who says, you know, he's good at drinking, he likes to dance, but he's, uh, you know, he's a typical student, overeducated, uh, blah, 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 uh, drawing too much of his own uh, ideas. And a lot of people, I think, uh, have drawn far too much from that. You know, Marx wasn't, didn't exactly pull punches when it came to people. Uh, and I think rather silly, in a rather silly fashion, have then said, oh, this, of course, this letter uh, may provide evidence that, you know, Marx saw it all come in. He saw 1914 or, you know, it's this kind of silly history. However, the serious point is that in a sense, that's a kind of macro, uh, microcosmic form of the reception of Kautsky, which you alluded to, how he's been forgotten, etc. We'll, we'll come back onto that. He becomes very uh, uh, um, closely uh, uh, acquainted and very good friends with uh, Friedrich Engels in particular. Uh, so Engels and Kautsky become very good friends up until uh, Engels' death in 1895. Uh, and, and really through, the, uh, through his work as a journalist and for the Sozialdemokrat, his early writings, but then particularly through his uh, editorship of Die Neue Zeit, which is uh, the New Age, uh, which was the main theoretical, uh, weekly theoretical of German social democracy, he then establishes a, rep a, a reputation for himself uh, as a quite serious Marxist thinker and theoretician. Um, the, probably the, 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 the breakthrough then comes for him, or if it hadn't come before, certainly by 1891, um, he is known as the, the guy that wrote a significant amount of the effort program of social democracy and his reputation therefore grows. So he really comes onto the scene in the 1880s, certainly in the early 1890s, 
and then following the death of Engels is seen as and would probably view himself as in not in a kind of arrogant way, but in the sense of the, the duty of continuing the work of Marx and Engels, developing their method as the kind of forming the theoretical basis of uh, of European uh, social democracy, of which he was at the core. So I think that's that's how he how he comes about. That's how he uh, establishes himself as the uh, really the, the the papal authority, the leading authority not only on the works of Marx and Engels but then uh, the, the theoretician of responding to the changing conditions the quickly changing conditions not just in terms of uh, uh, the, this, the 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 politics and economics of the age but also the the the, the, the rapidly growing uh, uh, social democratic uh, uh, party and um, and yeah I think that's how he arrives on the scene yeah so his um his he had a monthly magazine right it was a weekly. It's, I think it may have started off as a monthly, but it was a weekly. A Denoyed site okay. became a weekly, and that was founded basically under the, uh, like a lot of these publications, was founded uh, through the funds of a guy called Dietz. He was a Dietz. So the Dietz pub uh, publisher, um, and he would fund things like the uh, Die Neue Zeit, um, Die Gleichheit, which was Clara Zetkin's women's magazine, etc. So th there was a kind of strange, it becomes po party property later on, but the original funds were laid out by this guy who was a very wealthy uh, uh, social democrat who did a lot for, uh, for, for the, the cause of socialists in those earlier days, you know, getting the funds available and printing things. So there's a, a very famous photograph of Lenin sitting in his... Uh, office in the Kremlin in I think it's 1921 mm -hmm. and on the on the shelf behind him there are bound volumes of yeah. that newspaper correct that's right and uh, the uh, I think it's the uh, Steinberg the historian points out in his introduction to the Neuert site that Lenin indeed had the full collection so as you say, the bound volumes, you would, you would get them as a, as a publication, but then there would be uh, reprints of the entire, like annuals, you know, of the, of the entire, I think there'd be two a year. Uh, and Lenin, yeah, literally had the, the, the entire collection. And, you know, it's meant, you know, Maura Donald pointed this out in the 1980s as a kind of precursor to some of the work that's being done now is that um, Die Neue Zeit was the publication that was read most in Russian jails. <laughs> so, so when you have the emerging... Uh, a Russian workers' movement slightly later, 1880s, 1890s, as a slight delay, I suppose, behind the the the, the German one. Um, the, the you know the the Russian Social Democrats are in jail and they are speaking and reading German because that is really the I say the the theoretical output is coming from uh, from Germany from Stuttgart in this case where uh, Kautsky edited. But yeah, exactly. Lenin was a a, a very keen uh, avid reader of Die Neue Zeit, and if you look closely at uh, many of his polemics and his writings you can see that you know he's oh i need to pepper this particular phrase or uh, i need to back up this particular statement and you can almost see him reaching for a deny it site and then uh, you know throwing in a quote from kautsky or whoever it happens to be uh, on that matter you know the famous one of course in what is to be done that he lifts from kautsky's commentary on the heinpo program or infamous quote but you cannot you know sometimes you can see that he's literally just reaching behind and and, and substantiating or, or backing up some of the claims he's making with reference to the authority of this magazine exactly oh is it too much to say that lenin was a Kautsky? so sorry, sorry but you are a bit quiet is, again sorry is, yeah. is it is it too much to say that uh, lenin was a kautskyite I th so the, the 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 problem with with posing the question in that, in that way is that what do we mean by a Kautskyite, right? Uh, what what does that exactly mean? What period are we talking about? Because Kautsky's career is far from straightforward. I mean, every every politician uh, and thinker, you know, there, there, there's a development in their ideas, there's changes, there's continuities. I would I would say that you know Lenin um, is often unfairly portrayed as someone who chopped and changed and overthrew everything he once knew etc but in in the sense that if you, if you understand Kautskyism as the in the kind of Lars Lee way of the the F the effort program the minimum maximum program of social democracy the idea of merging the workers movement with the the, the underlying theoretical foundations of Marxism um, then indeed Lenin 
and, and all the rest of them, not just Lenin, Lenin you know, were, were to, to were Kautskyites in that sense, right? They 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 look to you know Lenin says you know we don't need to change something uh, uh, that already works, right? We 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 make no bones about the fact that we will emulate the airfoot program, and we you know we want to be like the Germans, which is why we need to overthrow the Tsar, we need political freedom, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, because that is our model. And you know he's not alone in that. The, 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 you know the the Russian Social Democrats, generally speaking. Uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll look to Germany. I say they're reading German. Uh, Lenin's uh, wife was a, a, like me. Uh, uh, you know, the the the, the, cre the creme de the creme of people in society who teach German. <laughs> so she would, you know, she famously um, uh, uh, translated Kautsky's book against Bernstein. Um, which Lenin really wanted to get out as quickly as possible so that you, the, you could see the revisionist movement emerging in Germany and how that was influencing people like Struve and other writers within the Social Democratic Party in Russia. So he says to her, you know, can we quickly get this into Russian? Um, and uh, unfortunately, that, that book hasn't been translated into English yet, but it was translated into Russian pretty quickly, thanks to Krupskaya, who was a, yeah, a trained Germanist and, uh, and really, really strong in the German language. So Again, that's something Donald Mario Donald pointed out in the in the nineteen eighties. Just the 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 significance of the German language and the German approach for mm. Russian social democrats, and that's no accident, right? Because as I say, people people saw what had happened in Germany: the party coming out of illegality uh, and, and and really just blossoming, and they thought, ah that's that's that works doesn't it right uh, and in that sense that was the that was the model for Lenin and for others the term maybe we can come back to this later but Kautskyite then becomes something else in terms of the uh what Kautsky's concrete political choices the renegade Kautsky as you say and the reception subsequently which is a, a slightly longer story but obviously uh, uh very central to this to our discussion today as well mm -hmm. okay let's get back to your book okay but Oh, uh, let's yeah. let's get back to your book. Sure. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, there are two big themes in this book: um, uh, Karl Kautsky's ideas on democracy, mm -hmm. um, which he he wrote in response to a debate with French socialists. That's right. And and then his thinking about republicanism, which again was a polemic. Um, so do, do you want to talk about these these two big themes in this book? Sure. So, so the, 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 um, the, the first one, 1893, which was reissued in 1911, uh, which is about parliamentarism uh, um, and, and direct democracy legislation by the people, etc. That was occasioned actually by a Swiss uh, uh, thinker called Karl Burkley, uh, who was an 1848er uh, involved in the 1848 revolution. Um, and like many people was then disappointed, you know, livid by the betrayal of the bourgeoisie in that revolution, um, as were Marx and Engels and others involved, but drew slightly different conclusions to Marx. For him, um, the project of democracy itself, representative democracy, was innately, kind of innately bourgeois. And in that sense, that, that, was, that, that was how he accounted for the failure of the Frankfurt Assembly, the fact that the, 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 the bourgeoisie uh, betrayed that revolution, they didn't arm the people, etc., etc. Whereas for Kautsky, um, and, and I th indeed for Marx and Engels, I would argue as well, that they, they drew slightly different conclusions from that. They, they, they rather said that the bourgeoisie um, in fact, is not interested in democracy as a minority class. So in that sense, the project of the working class is to fight for radical democracy at all levels. But that does involve uh, um, elections, recallability, indirect democracy rather than direct democracy. And Kautsky kind of takes that further then in relation to Switzerland, because obviously Switzerland, Berkeley is, in, is influenced by his immediate environment as well. So he has supporters in Swiss social democracy who are looking at the experience of the cantons. And, you know, e even today we have that legacy in Switzerland, right, of direct legislation, etc. And for Kautsky, there are a number of problems with that in terms of accountability, in terms of practical, the, the practical uh, implementation of democracy. So he goes into some detail about how you can't really, the working class cannot run a, a, a large modern state. Uh, again, the, there are some assumptions here which are, which are problematic, but just as a summary, uh, cannot run a, 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 a large democratic, a large state on the basis of small meetings and you know, mandating representatives to vote in a certain way. It's far more 
uh, um, useful, far more effective for the working class to rely on indirect dem democracy, recallability, accountability. And that's when he touches on the questions of the Paris Commune, which, as I show, really um, Kautsky is, is again, to take the lifting from <laughs> quotes from behind you, Kautsky, when he writes this stuff, is really picking out Marx and Engels and saying, OK, this is what they were saying. And this is what this is what our alternative should be. Um, in 1911, it's reissued because but the way Kautsky explains it is that direct democracy uh, is becoming more popular in social democracy itself. So it's not a question of referenda as the be all and end all to working class powers so much as it is we need more direct democracy within the party itself. Right. And he kind of go, uses the arguments he then put forward in originally in 1892, 1893 to um, say, no, we need party congresses. We need leadership. We need uh, accountability, etc. We need to defend the, the, the way in which social democracy has worked so far. So that's the that's the, sorry. Sorry, very good. That's the first. No, it's just just a question. Um, do you find um, anything in in these passages about democracy and parliamentarism? Mm -hmm. um, do you find anything there that um, gives uh, uh, a hint to what happened in nineteen fourteen and and afterwards? So, or, or do you think, yeah. or do you think that this is a, a what he actually was representing here was what we could call bona fide Marxism, you know, Marxism. Sure. So, so, so again, there's the, the, there's a, a number of theoretical assumptions there that are problematic when you look back, you know, what is bona fide Marxism? You know, is it, and, and you know, Kautsky was all, one of the things he always stressed was we cannot just repeat what Marx and Engels said. We have to develop their ideas. You know, he wrote a book, for example, or a, a pamphlet, to what extent is the communist manifesto out of date? And he would he would then you know critically work on and build upon them in terms of the national question, in terms of the agrarian question that were raging at the time, etc. Um, so, so he wasn't looking just to kind of copy and paste for kind of bona fide Marxism. So that's the first one that makes this discussion slightly difficult, I suppose. Although, I, as I say, I've actually, as I've shown in the book, when it comes to the concrete lessons that Marx and Engels themselves drew from an experience like the Paris Commune. I would say that Kautsky is relatively faithful to those, and I show you know the, how how that was in relation to the the Republic text. Um, so that's the just first. One other, just one other yeah. thing. Yeah. Does, do his ideas here feed into Lenin um, yes. with the State and Revolution? Absolutely. So so the, the so that that maybe we'll we'll deal with that quickly as well. So the, the question, what's interesting about Lenin um, is that when he comes to write State and Revolution, Penn's, writes it relatively quickly in 1917. Obviously, by that point, his relationship with Kautsky has fallen apart. Uh, I think quite rightly, Lenin charges Kautsky with um, burning everything he once held dear, right, in that sense, right, and, and throwing everything out. We'll look at that question maybe in, in a bit more detail for, you know, what, why did Kautsky become a renegade, etc. Um, but when it comes to 1917, the state and revolution, Kaut, uh, Lenin makes the, the, the claim that Kautsky really never theorized the state and that he never theorized how the working class movement must smash, zerbrechen, which literally in German means to, to break into small pieces, right? So when you have the zer uh, prefix in German without getting too linguistic, it means into small pieces. Um, and 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 it kind of leaves it at that and then because with that 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 state and revolution text is so foundational to all of us i mean it's probably one of the th first things you would have read when you became you know involved in the far left certainly for me you know youngsters coming through today it's it's such a foundational text um but i think it 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 is slightly misleading in the sense that if it, the text that I've translated here, the two texts, particularly the Republic one, show that Kautsky is absolutely explicit. The goal of the workers' movement, not just in this text either, but in various points throughout his career, the working class movement cannot just kind of uh, take over the existing ministries and run them in a socialist way. That's the whole point of the debate with Milovan, for example, right, who becomes a, a, so a leftist minister in a bourgeois government that also includes Valdec Rousseau, who was the, uh, excuse the pronunciation, was also the um, the butcher of the Paris Commune, right? So a highly symbolic uh, um, uh, move. Um, and that's the whole point of Kautsky. Look, the socialist revolution is not about just uh, getting a government majority and then you know, running a uh, running the old state in a, in a kind of nicer, more left-wing way. No, it's about creating new institutions of power 
à la la par the, the Paris Commune. So it's a, in, in terms of the state and revolution, Lenin, clearly Lenin is influenced in terms of his politics, you know, and that's it is a Kautskyite in terms of the, the his development of Russian social democracy, the need to smash the state. But what's interesting is that the um, when it comes to state and revolution, he actually makes claims whether he forgot it, whether he's writing it quickly. But you would have expected, given what you said at the start of this podcast as well, that Lenin was so acquainted with Dinoyed site, he would have read these articles that I've been translating and uh, etc. So. I think it's um, so that's muddied the waters, as it were, when it comes to this question of Kautsky on the state. Uh, now, maybe going back a question as well, if I may, that's not to say that there aren't problems in Kautsky and views of democracy and parliament, etc. But having said that, again, I think as, as as Marxists, particularly in the period we find ourselves now, we have to be rigorous with our own traditions and what we've inherited. You know, we're not uh, coming at things from a, a point of, uh, of of strength at the moment. I think we really have to re re you know, re reinterrogate what we've learned and think constantly. And that would also apply for Marx and Engels, who made many mistakes on on various questions. Uh, Lenin himself certainly made a lot of mistakes. So I think that that's the that's the problem I have sometimes with this question of do you see the germ or the the seed of what happened in 1914 here yes i think there are there are elements of that but i think the problem one of the main things i stress in terms of the uh, looking at kautsky is the problems involved in uh, left-wing historiography of this period particularly which is always about reading back from 1914 sometimes to a letter from Marx to Engels about Kautsky which is just absurd and it reminds me a little bit of this stuff about you know oh Stalin uh, uh, was you know dumped by some by a, a, a girlfriend of his at a young age therefore it's, it's that kind of it's, it, it's really is kind of unhelpful history right but yes there are there are some uh, um, I think problematic theory, theoretical assumptions that Kautsky makes um, when it comes to the modern state, for example, he kind of um, assumes the existence of a state bureaucracy uh, of, the, of the judiciary to a certain extent as well as just a given rather than thinking, OK, how do we fit those into our uh, alternative to the state, etc. But in terms of the overriding conclusions of what he draws from Marx and Engels on the need to smash the state, the need to create new forms of power, et cetera, et cetera, um, I think that's the that's pretty good stuff. And it's actually something in terms of republicanism, not in the kind of trite sense of, you know, uh, um, was it John Eales, I think, who refused to uh, shake the Queen's hand back at, you know, this is, I'm thinking of Australian uh, <laughs> history, uh, you know, but, but, you know that, not in the trite sense of just being against the monarchy, which is important, but actually republicanism as the form in which uh, we envisage the working class coming to power. And Marx and Engels certainly wrote a lot about that. Kautsky does here. And Lenin obviously drew on that as well, the significance of the democratic republic. So yes, there are, there are seeds, there are problems, but that's not how fundamentally I would account for um, uh, uh, Kautsky's 1914 renegacy, if you like. Okay, look, um, <clears throat> as an Australian, um, this question of republicanism is um, important. Now, uh, I can't remember how many years ago it was. <laughs> uh, we had a, a very right-wing prime minister here called John Howard, and he was forced into a position where he had to have a referendum on Australia becoming a republic. And he beat off that republic by um, putting a particularly well-phrased question about it to the Australian yeah. people. And um, the majority of people wanted a republic, but nobody trusted our politicians to appoint the head of state. Um, and so by confusing those two things, he was able to cripple the entire move. Um, so what did Kautsky talk about with republicanism? And what did Lenin take from it? Sure. That, that's really interesting, isn't it? I admit, you know, hopefully, well, maybe it would have been nice if this book or these materials had been available in the 80s because in English, because really, the, you know, that those two questions, it's not just about referenda, uh, but then the question of the Republic, how it feeds into referenda, right? And Kautsky's main point, which I, I kind of didn't uh, stress enough, maybe in the in, when it comes to referenda, is that referenda fundamentally, and if you look at this, it's true, uh, are tools of 
Bonapartism, of right-wing reaction that kind of purport to be democratic, purport to be popular and sovereign and democratic and, and nice and everything and popular involvement. But actually, given that the people that are at the, usually putting through that referenda set the question, often then set the terms of debate, etc., uh, that is a real drawback. So, you know, there are examples from history I mean, the, the different ones, you know, the, the Shah, uh, 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 the, sorry, the Islamic Republic uh, had a referendum. And, you know, do you want the Shah back? No, <laughs> nobody wants the Shah <laughs> back. But what do you, what do you want? Uh, Hitler, plebiscite, you know, Bonaparte, you know, there's all sorts of, uh, uh, of, of examples of that. So that's the main thing about this question of, of referenda is that actually it's a way of, it's often a way of holding back popular will and the popular uh, uh, dem demand for change. So the Girondists, for example, in the, uh, the, the, the wanted to res restore the French uh, uh, monarchy, they were very keen on referenda precisely as a way of stalling the revolutionary progress as such. So Kautsky draws upon all these, not all these examples, but the Girondists, for example, he talks about in some detail, and it's, it's quite interesting. Um, so that's the referenda question and why that can actually be used. It has the pretense of democracy and, and popular legitimacy, but actually serves to reinforce the projects of semi-dictators or wannabe dictators, right? That's the one question. On the Republic side of things, so it, for him, uh, building upon Marx and Engels, Marx and Engels, uh, you know, very, uh, will quite famously say that the, uh, the, the, the Democratic Republic is the form under which they envisage the working class coming to power, the form under which uh, the, the, the class struggle will be, uh, will be fought out to the end, as it were, right? Um, so for them, the, 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 the democratic republic was not just the sense of this sense of, oh, we got rid of the monarch. And again, this relates to the, the question of the third republic, um, because basically what you had in the third republic was an elected monarch. Right. And again, you've got it in, in many democracies today. So called you have presidential powers where. You know, you have a, you don't have a, a king or queen anymore, but the president has so much influence over the running of the state, etc., that you know basically it's an elected monarch, and that was what Engels said of the French Third Republic, etc. So they they're not just about that. It's not just in that trite sense of we're against the monarchy. It's our republican uh, alternative looks something like the uh, Paris Commune, right? In the sense that you've not just got rid of the monarchy, but you've got popular democracy spread to all levels of society, that you have things like the armed people, recallability, the workers' wage question. It's slightly idealized because the Paris Commune really didn't function for that long. It was more, but what, and, it, and it didn't function particularly well either. Obviously there's a question of women and, and uh, women's involvement in the state that was, that was not dealt with. You know, there wasn't enough time to push that through. There are lots of things they wanted to achieve, but then, you know, they're faced with invasion, et cetera. They couldn't do it. But Marx and Engels, for them, they look at this and they say, yes, that's what we understand. Engels in a famous speech in, in London, I think, says, that's the dictatorship of the proletariat, my friends, right? If, if, you, if you want to know what we're about, that's the kind of thing we're looking at, right? Um, so, and Kautsky builds on that when it comes to this question of the republic. So in the French socialist movement, people like Millerand and his supporters say, hey, we've got the republic. Right. And look at you backward Germans. You've still got a monarch and you're still under, you know. Uh, so for us, our, our strategy is a completely different one. American socialists said similar things. Right. We, for us, really, it's not about the, the class question anymore because we've got the republic. And that means we can come to power. We can uh, uh, share in a government power here because our tasks are different. You've still got to get rid of your monarch. Right. Before you can do that. And Kautsky says, no, 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 no. You, do, you don't understand anything about uh, republicanism in the Marxist sense. Right. Republicanism is just as important in the French Third Republic or in today's America or today's France, for that, uh, for that matter, or today's Germany, you know, democratic Republican states, so-called. Um, it's just as important there as it is in Germany or Russia or Austria, right? Because for us, it's not just about getting rid of the uh, monarchy. It's about our alternative state form. And that involves really, you can see it as the culmination or the, the victory or the achievement of the uh, political demands of the minimum program, which is you know, common to all this, uh, the social democratic parties at the time, the effort program in, uh, in Germany, the Heinfeld program in Austrian social democracy, uh, the RSDLP program in Russia, et cetera, et cetera. So that really is this, this kind of two souls of republicanism in, in the workers' movement, the Milorandists who say, yes, now we've got the Republic, we can become board ministers in this Republic because it's a progressive thing. And Kautsky says, no, 
what you need in France is to fight for the kind of republic that the Paris Commune embodied. And that means overthrowing the French Third Republic, not working within it, just as we have to in Germany overthrow the Kaiserreich mm. uh, and, and, and fight for alternative forms. So I think that's how these two things fit together. Okay, well, uh, so Kautsky was um, truly radical. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I believe it was in, um, in the war between Prussia and France in 1871, the, the very war that led to the Paris, Paris Commune, mm -hmm. There, was, there were some social democrats in the parliament there mm -hmm. and the question came up of should they vote for war credits. Now, can you walk us through there, through that? What, sure. what, was, what were the issues in the debate and how did, that, how did those issues slop over into 1914? Okay, so, so again, just to start off, you know, obviously we have to be careful, but, you know, 1871, 19, 1870, 1914, big period of time, lots of change, etc. different, slightly different wars as well. I mean, you know, et cetera. So we'll keep that as a, as a kind of caveat. But in terms of the, yes, the, the, there are two social Democrats in the, what's called the, the Reichstag des Norddeutschen Bundes, which is the, the Reichstag of the North German Federation, I think it's called in English, um, which is basically the alliance of states under... Uh, the Prussian king and Bismarck, right? And they have a particular project to unite Germany in their in 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 their own way from from above. Marx and Engels, obviously, through their experience of 1848, were very keen in uniting Germany from below through the revolution, and that would include not just what we understand as Germany today, but including places like Austria, for example, right? They, they, they wanted a, a large, because again, large states means larger working classes, which means, you know, more chance for revolutionary change. So that's the kind of immediate backdrop. Then you have the French Third Republic and Bonaparte. Um, and formally speaking, what happens is the French Third Republic declares war on the North German Federation and some of its allied states, right? And then it comes to the question in, 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 the, in the Reichstag, it's, there's no debate on it, but there is a vote about whether to approve credits for the, res the military response, right, against this, this declaration of war, which is, again, it's a complicated question because Germany at the time is, is composed of all these different states. You've also got Denmark, Austria, the question of Alsace-Lorraine and, uh, and how that relates between Germany and France. But the, the long story short is France declares war. It comes to this question, I think, in, in March 1870 of war credits. There's no debate, but there is a vote. And the two Social Democrats, two incredibly important people in the history of our movement, August Bebel, who was kind of, to, to take us aside here, in many ways was Kautsky's kind of hitman, as it were. So he would be the, he would be the, uh, the political representative and make the clear political choices in because he was a parliamentarian and leader of the party in that sense. And Kautsky would kind of work with him and often then provide the theoretical basis or a bit more of a historical basis for be able to back up his arguments. And that's true, for example, in this question of the Republic in 1904, 1905, because it's Babel in the Amsterdam Congress who debates Jaurès uh, as, a, as a representative of reformist socialism in France, and Kautsky you know, intervenes in this debate. So Babel, incredibly important. Wilhelm Niebnest is the other one. Uh, um, again, you know, uh, incredibly important figure. And they're at, then asked, okay, uh, the, the, then it comes to this discussion, sorry, this vote in Parliament, there's no discussion, how do you vote? And for them, they have a suspicion that the French declaration of war shouldn't be taken as uh, at face value. And the reason they, they suspect this is because they're aware of Bismarck and they're aware of some of the Bismarckian tricks that have been employed, certainly in the in 1866 war and the war with Denmark, that Bismarck plays a very often a very clever game. And it turns out later, and actually Leibniz writes a little pamphlet on this, which I'll, I'll hopefully translate the preface to uh, uh, pretty pretty soon. It's called, the, the, I think, I don't, again, I don't know the English, but I think it's called the, the Dispatch of Ems, the Ems Dispatch, which is a document with which uh, Bismarck then claims, to, okay, this is why the French are after us, etc. This is why we have to have war. But they have a they have a, 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 an inclination that that this document is is falsified, and was falsified by Bismarck precisely with the with the aim 
of getting the French to, to declare war on them because Bismarck thought, I think correctly, it was a good judgment that if the French declare war, then some of the states that he wishes to see united but under the Prussian banner will then join the German side in defense and, uh, and therefore facilitate his project of united Germany under Prussian, under the, under the heel of the Prussian jackboot or whatever, right? Uh, that was, that was <laughs> kind of the thing. So, and, uh, so the, 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 um, that the pamphlet's called the Ems Dispatch, which is this document about the, the Prussian king being uh, uh, um, insulted by the French emissary. It's, it's all a bit complicated and it's all about uh, the Spanish uh, uh, succession, etc. You know, it's, it's quite a complicated backstory and we're not really familiar with it in terms of popular uh, historical consciousness anymore. Um, but they, they produce a pamphlet subsequent, subsequently called The Ems Dispatch and How Wars Are Made. And in that for the preface to that, Leibniz says, yes, we were right. Now we've got documentary proof that Bismarck was pulling a fast one here so it comes to this question of you know how do you then respond to that when it comes to a vote for war credits and the way they so they're not allowed to speak but they make a statement that, that, that uh, um, uh, to, to justify their, their pay but they decide to abstain and they say they put it like this they say if we vote for the credits I think quite correctly, this will be seen as a vote of confidence in the project of Prussia and the Bismarck, correct? Right? Which would be a bad thing. We are not interested in that, right? They were interested in United Germany, but they were very wary of Prussia. Prussia is up there as you know the one of the the, the, the most reactionary states in, in 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 Europe at the time, right? Has its own agenda, militarist agenda under the Kaiser, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, fig leaf for absolutism is what uh, uh, Leibniz called the Parliament and the, uh, the North German Confederation, right? So they were aware of what they're about. But then, they, on the other hand, they say, "Look, but if we vote against, then that also could be seen as a kind of vote of semi-confidence in Bonaparte and his reactionary agenda, right?" So their, their, their logic is we will abstain and here's why. And they make a declaration that they refuse to, to vote for or against the credits against actually the, the advice of Marx and Engels, who for, they see the, the war, uh, maybe it's because they're further away or maybe it's their particular reading of it. Um, they say, well, actually, in terms of the first phase of this war, it's, it's right to back the credits because this pro if the French win, then the project of German unity is out the is is out the window, right? Which is also correct as a judgment, um, but you see how these things are, are, are quite complicated. And I think in terms of the the, the response of Liebknecht and uh, uh, and, uh, and Babel, they they did get it right. Uh, and even though it, it might be seen from today's perspective, or oh, abstention, that's a bit weak, that's a bit pathetic. It was taken certainly as a uh, as a no vote and a vote of no confidence in Prussia. They were harassed on the streets. They had their windows smashed in, etc., by this this mob. Because again, Bismarck is not only pulling tricks in terms of diplomacy, but he's pulling tricks in terms of controlling and influencing the press. So there's this huge propaganda campaign against the lazy, decadent, whatever French people, right? Um, and that, that that's quite a successful one because again, you know, the immediate response to their actions, Leibniz and Babel, is is an entirely negative one. They then get hauled before the courts for their actions, right? So they they they're on trial for high treason uh, in 1871, um, uh, precisely because of this of, of their their behaviour in in Parliament. So they say it might be seen as slightly weak, as a slight as a kind of. Um, of sidestepping the issue slightly, if you if you like, but it, it really wasn't, and I think their their judgment was correct, and it does really underline this point that you know, which maybe is without drawing too much of a simplistic parallel, the way wars are started for us Marxists, it shouldn't be who fires the first shot or who declares war necessarily, because we surely the, the method of historical materialism dialectics is is to you know move away from the the microscopic view of things to take a step back and say what is the 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 backdrop here and they suspected Bismarck's hand in this and it turns out they were correct however even today historians dispute what was exactly Bismarck's role what was what were the motivations behind it what were the, the French motivations so it's even today it's disputed but I think as a judgment that was the right call sorry a very long discourse there but <laughs> no, that was very informative I, I found that fascinating um so I, I won't go to 1914 because I think that's damn well known mm -hmm. but what I what I was interested in by referring to 1914 was social chauvinism yeah 
um, because that's what the German Social Democrats demonstrated in mm -hmm. 1914. And um, so how about we you know, jump ahead about sure. 120 years <laughs> and um, we are in a, we're in a period of war right now. Now, Lenin said that we, uh, of his time, that we were in an epoch of wars and revolutions. Um, now, it does seem to me that for a goodly amount of time, uh, that epoch was frozen. Perhaps mm -hmm. it was frozen by the Cold War. I'm not too sure. But it looks to me like we are in an epoch of wars and revolutions again. Um, and, I, and, well, I'm just wondering about your reading of social chauvinism these days, given the uh, Russian invasion of uh, Ukraine. Yeah, the, I, again, so, so my, my, my starting point, you know, a bit like I, I take quite a bit from Kautsky in, in this, in the sense that you know, Kautsky would say, you know, I'm always interested in things, how things come about, how things were in the past. So for me, I'm kind of the kind of person that I see this stuff and I think, oh, I need to look at Babel and Liebknecht again. I need to look at 1914 again, and, you know, and to, to see what we can draw, because it, clearly Lenin, Lenin's uh, diagnosis and in a sense, his prognosis of what's to come is based on the uh, the idea as well, quite rightly, the confidence that, okay, the, the, the movement might be collapsing at the moment. It's going in all sorts of directions. The, 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 the challenge of 1914 really breaks up uh, the, the European social democracy um, in, in sometimes quite interesting ways. But his thing is, okay, if we can fight for a clear internationalist line, if we can join with others, not to create something radically new, but actually to uphold, and you read this in Luxembourg, you read this in, in Lenin as well, to uphold and build upon the resolutions that the Second International once passed, right, which, which said, following a, a res, an amendment from Martov, Luxembourg and Lenin, that said, you know, we will use the, the, the opportunity or the crisis created by war to make revolution in our own states and in international coordinated fashion, um, you know we can build upon the what we have as a strong workers' movement that's been politically led astray for now, and we can we have the confidence that we can do something. And you know, in some ways that played out, in some ways it didn't. Right uh, today, the left, the workers' movement is in a far weaker position. We do, you know you can't really speak of workers parties anywhere in, in the sense of you know hugely rooted revolutionary organizations whatever the flaws of the spd etc do, do you sort of mean so it's, it's a different situation in that sense and what's what's interesting for me is that in you know if, if we just do touch on 1914 just briefly the social chauvinism thing is actually many of the people that go to the far right of the spd and had their origins in the far left so again, I've done work on uh, a group called Die Glocke, which means the bell, right? The, 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 the bell around people like Alexander Parvus, who is relatively well known, uh, but people also like Paul Lynch. Paul Lynch was a, uh, a far leftist uh, on the part, far left of the party, a Reichstag deputy, friend of Rosa Luxemburg, theorist of imperialism, but he flips it completely. So he says, look, imperialism is, is a necessary feature of today's world, which is, you know that was what they were saying against the people who said well imperialism is a policy it doesn't really matter um you know so he was quite right on that but he then draws the opposite conclusion from that and says well look it's a necessary feature so actually we need to defeat britain because britain is the dominant power in the world and because it's the dominant power in the world it also has no serious workers movement because it can buy off its workers and it doesn't have social democracy it has laborism and blah 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 so i've worked on that at, at various things but in terms of Kautsky in the center, they're not really social chauvinist in, in that sense, right? It's a bit more complicated. So when it comes to the vote in the Reichstag, Kautsky never had a position in the party formally, He was, but he was an advisor to the, the Reichstag deputies. And on August, uh, I think it's the 3rd or maybe even the 4th, I can't remember exactly the day, early August, they have a meeting about how to respond to war credits this time around, right? Given what's going on with Belgium, et cetera, et cetera, Germany, France. And he argues that they should abstain, a la Leib Babel and Liebknecht, right? Which certainly would have been yeah. a much better position uh, than what than what than what happened, right? Um, and but he's he, he doesn't win the day. And I think you know, talking about this renegacy question, I think then Kautsky says, okay, I need to go along with this 
uh, I don't want to split the party. Uh, and you know, you can really see then his his ideas uh, uh, change. One of the things I look at is, uh, you know, how does this reflect itself, for example, on the question of republicanism and strategy? So, for example, in 1921, he writes a programmatic book uh, um, called The Proletariat. It's, it's in, I think it's in English. Most of it's in English. It's The Labour Revolution. 1924, I think, was, was translated. Uh, but in it was in 22, The Proletarian Revolution and its programme. He now has moved from uh, this idea of uh, the Paris Commune, uh, a, a single elected parliament, recallability, uh, abolish the state bureaucracy to embracing the separation of powers. So far more liberal take. So it's not just these things float in the air. Lenin is quite right to say this guy is broken with his revolutionary past. right? And you see that not enough research has been done on that, but you see concretely how that manifests itself. Now, where does that come from? Yes, in part, it can be it can be taken from. Um, uh, from his career and some of the, the 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 inadequacies maybe in terms of his understanding of, of imperialism etc uh, sorry his understanding of democracy etc but i think actually it's a fundamental political choice that kautsky makes in 1914 and from that you know you have once you make that kind of decision you have to then start to draw the conclusions right and you're working with certain people so he goes along with the majority of the spd um which basically takes the uh the narrative of national defense in the sense of this france but there's also russia so there is an in, in, there is a genuine sense in which germany is in, in in circle on one level but what's the conclusion do you draw from that and i think that that's you know where the the, the babel leap nest thing is far more interesting and in terms of today i just think that the the, the left is 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 weak and it's also in my you know it's almost i i don't log into facebook that often but it's almost every time i do there's just a, there's been another shift to the right of a lot of things i'm seeing and and, and, and you know it, it's the pressure i think of this quite successful um mobilization of opinion in in the in the west i think you know I, initially i thought america would be slightly concerned about it that it can't do anything but actually <laughs> You know, this is a this is a classic game of you know if you take the Bismarckian thing, it's a classic game of cat and mouse. And sometimes, given you know America's dominance, given NATO, you can force your opponent into making uh, a silly move, right? And and vice versa. And that's, again, I'm not putting it all on on NATO. I'm not putting it all on Putin. But to say this is just you know the the the, the politics of a madman in Putin, or you know these crazy, or you know the Stalin thing again that he wasn't loved as a kid, or I don't know whatever. And, you know, it seems to me very uh, very short sighted. But I just think that. Uh, the, the in terms of you know I'm sure it's similar in Australia as well I mean uh, again I'm t t I'm a rugby fan you know even to the point where you see you know that that great place of the progressive ideas Twickenham where England play rugby uh, which you know all well once said if you if you stuck a bomb under the under the seats there you'd get rid of the th threat of fascism for a generation right you once said about Twickenham but you know Wales versus I think it was Wales versus England you know, big screen Twickenham for Ukraine, you know, so it's, it's just, it's just, it's just this mobilization of opinion that has been successful because, you know, quite rightly, there's a human response that people see people being bombed and, and you know, invaded in Ukraine and, and driven out of their own country, etc. There's a kind of human level. Uh, to that there's, but, but the problem is, it, but given the weakness of the left and given the dominance of bourgeois ideas, it's kind of just then taken a give, as a given that NATO now we're interested in, you know, in the US, so they're there now to promote uh, democracy and freedom. And so like, we'll read a book, you know, well, when when is the US and NATO, you know, I, I'm old enough to remember when the left was against NATO. Um, and, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, and, and that's the, the problem. So, you know, even in Congress now, the, the did you see that the amendment of, um, okay, we we're going to send weapons and money uh, and somebody tried to move an amendment saying they probably shouldn't go into the hands of fascistic organizations, but that was struck, that was defeated. So, you know, it's, so to me, it's, it, it's a reflection of the left's extreme weakness, the left's uh, tendency at the moment to think in terms of tomorrow, in terms of how do we, how do we latch onto something now to get a big breakthrough? How do we latch into something that's popular? And, you know, sometimes like Babel and Liebner, you have to be unpopular. And, and so, you know, one of Lenin's favorite phrases was aus sprechen was ist, right, in German, to say, to say things how they are, to say what is, literally. Um, and I think that's, that, that's the problem. But the, the thing about this question of war and revolution, it always throws a big challenge to the left. It cannot be otherwise, right? The left has to think, okay, how do we respond to this? We've talked about 1871, 1914, different circumstances. But to me, 
it does lead to uh, fundamental uh, re realignments and shifts. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, particularly confident at the moment in terms of a kind of new Simmerwald movement or a new realignment of the left that is opposed to that, unfortunately. But but again, you never know. I think that the, the, the other side, to, to draw the Babel Liebknecht example, the, the, at that point, the German workers movement was very weak. The German work, they had two deputies, they're in illegality. Um, so, sorry, they're not in illegality, but they're in the kind of conditions of semi-legality because there's no there's no elections in most of the uh, most of what is now Germany, etc. So, it's it's difficult for them. But they're, the fact that they speak out and and kind of set a marker in that sense feeds into uh, the development of independent working class politics, which was always an issue, right? Because if you think of LaSalle, LaSalle thought that you know again such an important figure in terms of working class independence, working class party, but the Lasallians had many illusions in Bismarck. They had many illusions in in the in Prussia. So for them to make that stand, I think really did without it, without being too teleological about it, a brave principled stand helped to pave the way for the brilliance then in the, the huge success of German social democracy in the seventies into illegality in 78 and then, you know, a mass party in the 1890s. Okay, now, um, okay. <laughs> ben, um, uh, you, you have dedicated yourself to translating um, Kautsky's works into yep. English and you, you have a, uh, one of these uh, Pantheon sites or something? What Patreon, are they yeah. Patreon. Patreon. Okay, and uh, do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Sure. So, um, it, it, I suppose that the, the long, the long story short is that basically, I, I, I was, I read uh, um, Lars Lee's book uh, on on Lenin and you know, the influences between uh, uh, the influences of Kautsky on Lenin, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, about about two thousand eight, and I, just in two thousand eight, I was coming out of my. Um, I just finished as an undergraduate. I'm a, uh, in Germanic studies, so I'm a, I'm a Germanist, formally speaking, right? Um, and I thought, hmm, this is quite interesting. This is this this is really good stuff. And obviously, Lars works on the Russian material, and I thought, well, you know, surely there must be space for more uh, work on the German. It soon became clear to me, precisely because of this uh, complicated legacy of social democracy, and it's kind of dismissed offhand as, oh. Uh, the airfoot program led to 1914 or you know the, these kind of very simplistic ideas that we've inherited and kind of were common sense for a long time um i thought there's there's a lot more work to be done but i wasn't quite sure i, I wasn't quite aware of just how much stuff is is un, is unavailable is untranslated etc so you know as you say I, I set up this project on the side uh, during lockdown initially which is just really uh, working on texts that you know most activists english-speaking activists will have never seen uh, have never discussed uh, and there's so much of it you can imagine you know german social democracy had a hundred daily newspapers uh, right um it had all sorts of theoretical journals from the right to the left you know it's like we've mentioned um so yeah I'm, I'm basically working my way through uh through these texts finding interesting stuff i've done everything from clara zetkin on the women's question august babel on the women's question through to parvis's stuff against bernstein and the other revisionists again <laughs> stuff that hasn't been translated for you know, over 100 years which is in in a sense criminal right i mean it's really really uh, uh, worrying that, that this material has just been kind of uh, stuck in the archives for so long and again I, I think it reflects the way in which we have uh, um, assumed or learnt our, our working class history which is basically Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin depending on who you know who the figure is Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, Mao you can get most of their stuff but pretty much everything in, in in English you know generally speaking so that was the focus right this great man of history which kind of uh, was absorbed into our movement somehow um and I think that you know the benefit of so I also did this Zinoviev and Martov discussion in 1920 it's good to get both sides as well so even though my project is called Marxism Translated, I also look sometimes at, you know, what you could sort of suppose call revisionism translated, you know, the, the, some of the arguments that were made against uh, these things, just to get a much more broader picture rather than, you know, oh, uh, the usual thing, Lenin or Luxembourg or whoever it was, was the, the sole figure who saw all this come in and blah, blah, blah. So it just offers a bit more of a rounded uh, uh, approach to these things. And I think it, you know, hopefully the, the, the intention is, okay, it allows me to do what I love. Uh, and what I'm good at, but also the intention behind it is that it can, uh, you know, 
it can help to educate ourselves as a leftist movement in, at a time when we are in, you know, ideologically, politically, programmatically pretty, pretty rudderless. I don't want to put, you know, too much of a down uh, downer on it because you know, I'm, I'm also optimistic. I think there are there are chances for the left in this period. There are opportunities, but I think we need a far more rigorous uh, culture of discussion, of thinking, you know, of, of you know, of, of frankly exchanging ideas as well. One of the great things about uh, the European social democracy is that they didn't mince their words. They had public discussions. You know, the, 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 in, the, I'm, I'm currently translating Kautsky's book against Bernstein, who at one point was probably his best friend in the world. They have a massive falling out. And, you know, it's public. It's, it's books, it's articles. People are reading it, discussing it. And I think that's really uh, one of the many things that we can do to, to, to invigorate uh, modern, uh, you know, far left uh, political culture. And yeah, that's the idea behind Marxism translated on, on Patreon. So, you know, uh, um, if any, any listeners would be interested, then please, you know, give us a follow. <laughs> that's the pitch. Right. <laughs> and, oh yeah and um you also write for the weekly worker yes and UK? unfortunately not so much of late because of just particular uh, demands on family life dad life etc and trying still trying to get some kind of foot in, uh, <laughs> in in academia and a job um but yes i write for the weekly worker uh, uh, and plan to do so a little bit more uh, regularly in, in the coming period my the current research project, the bigger research project, is actually um, Clara Zetkin's Die Gleichheit, which was her uh, a magazine, Equality, which was a was a fortnightly magazine um, founded in 1891 through to, and she edited through to 1917 when, like Kautsky and others, the SPD leadership kicked her out for her because she used basically she used this platform and she used her connections as probably the leading figure in European social democratic women's movement um, to uh, to mobilize against the war right and to mobilize the left against the war so she you know she was kicked out even Kautsky was kicked out who didn't have anywhere near the kind of sense that uh, that Zetkin had um, but he was also too much for the SPD leadership in 1917 so no excitement from him so that's my kind of broader project at the moment which will be over the next two or three years and that will obviously also find reflection in in the, the in the patreon as well so the moment i'm translating a book by her in 1889 which is uh, the position of women in in modern society she put it in the capitalist society so yeah th that that'll be a big project looking at how um the the the, the social democratic parties try to navigate the women's question and set out its own uh, approach to this question and how they tried to politicize women and draw them into the the ranks of social democracy in terms of the trade unions and the party and the problems they faced and, and the issues that, that threw up etc so right thank you